Great. Well, thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today. I'm Sarah Chang, the Director of Policy and Advocacy Programs here at Research America. And I'm going to give a brief moment and turn it to my colleague, Joel, who's going to talk a little bit more about our alliance. Hi, Hi Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to those on the West Coast. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Joel Nepomucino, and I am the Director of Membership here at Research America, and we have a lot of members on the call today, and for that I'd like to send a personal thank you for your membership and support, but we also have um, some non-members, and for those I'd like to invite you to connect with me to learn more about membership within the Research America Alliance. Uh, my email is going to be put in the chat, and I love the opportunity to just learn more about your research and development priorities share a little bit more about Research America and our mission, the benefits of membership, and to better understand if or how we can best support your top R&D goals. So I will look forward to connecting and I'll turn it back to my colleague, Sarah. Great, thanks so much, Joel. Yep. And thanks again to our Alliance members. Um, for now, I'm really excited to get to the main event. John Crowley, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, John, thank you, Sarah. Ahead, is please. the chairman and CEO of Amicus Therapeutics. And we really appreciate you taking the time to talk about uh, your personal journey and your, your vision on um, R&D today. So thanks again. No, it's great to be here with Research America. I remember it was a couple of years ago, I was in DC to speak at a couple of your different events over the years. So happy to join by Zoom today. Perfect. Well, for those of us that um, have only touched upon your story, let's start there. Tell us what got you into the journey of uh, medical research, and then let's talk a little bit about what Amicus is working on today. Yeah, happy to. I, you know, our family's journey is actually very similar to many families in broadly, I think, in the world of healthcare. And for us, it began 25 years ago last month when our then 15-month-old daughter, Megan, was diagnosed with a rare form of muscular dystrophy known as Pompeii disease. And up until that point, you know, Megan was seem seemingly healthy. She was not pulling up in the crib, not taking those first steps. And we went on that diagnostic odyssey, which was, was fairly brief for, for our family, for Megan going from pediatrician to neurologist, from blood tests to scan to deep muscle biopsy, and then eventually getting the diagnosis of this disease that we had never heard of that there's no history in our family. My, my wife, Eileen, and I are silent carriers, like we all are for any number of disorders. Um, and in Pompeii disease, as silent carriers and autosomal recessive disorder, there's a one in four chance that any of our children would have this disease. So manifested through some, some small symptoms. And then we were also told that uh, our then seven-day-old son, Patrick, had a one in four chance of having the disease as well. And we got him tested. And that launched us into the whole world of medicine and getting the diagnosis that then there was very, very little research, very, very little known about this and many other rare diseases and told that we should enjoy the, the time we had and um, for it, that it might only be a couple of years for the children. And that launched us in the whole world of medicine. I'm not a researcher, a scientist, I'm not a physician, but a pretty passion impassioned parent. And I think more than anything, Sarah, we came into this whole world of research, of biotechnology, because we wanted to try to make a difference. And we didn't want to look back years later, frankly, and, and wished we had done something else, something more. And so that launched us into the whole world of medicine and research papers and science conferences and learning about this, this wonderful, virtuous circle that is necessary to allow the creation of therapeutics, vaccines, medicines that ultimately extend and enhance life. And for us, you know, you know ultimately we were successful with a, an enormous number of people helping along the way to develop a first generation therapy for Pompeii that saved our children's lives. And now thankfully there are many researchers, biotech companies, big pharma companies, and our own company Amic is working on hopefully newer and better treatments for people living with Pompeii, but also a, a range of rare diseases. And that's really our focus today. I, you know, the first company we founded was really focused on only Pompeii disease. Mm -hmm. And it was a sprint. 
you know, for our children's lives and, and the lives of, of others that we knew. In founding Amicus more than 18 years ago, we wanted to create a company that would become a global company that would focus on development of new medicines for rare, devastating diseases. And I think that's a really important thing for all of us to remember, knowing that there are now nearly 8,000 known rare diseases. The vast, vast majority, 95 plus percent, have no treatments, no therapeutic options. And even those that do, um, we need even better and newer treatments. So there's tremendous need for companies like Amicus. And now, thankfully, we, we have quite a few in our world of biotechnology and increasingly large pharmaceutical companies involved in rare disease medicines. And that's our focus at Amicus. You know, we've grown the company to now more than 500 employees in several dozen countries. And uh, we have an approved medicine in uh, Fabre disease. We are on the cusp of an approved generation, uh, next generation therapy in Pompeii disease around the world. And we're, we're constantly looking at other opportunities. Even just this morning, I, we uh, had a briefing from our team looking at a number of different muscular dystrophies as well, constantly thinking, where is there unmet need? Where can our team's skills and abilities come together to look at technologies? And that's an important point for us. We've always been agnostic as to technologies. Even for Fabre and Pompeii today, our lead programs, two very different technologies. We also have early research programs in Batten disease, uh, other rare diseases using genetic medicine, gene therapies, and constantly looking at what are the diseases and what other technologies can we bring to bear. Um, so that's uh, kind of our family's journey and, and where we are. And the good news is, thankfully, our uh, our older son, John, um, does not have Pompeii. And, and John has given us our granddaughter, Stella, with his wife, Amanda, who's 10 months old. And our Megan and Patrick, you know, despite living with a, a, a rare, devastating neuromuscular disease, continue to thrive. Pompeii, um, I guess one blessing is it, it doesn't affect the mind. They're incredibly strong, tough, and smart, um, you know, young, young adults now. Megan, having gone on to earn a bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame. And I saw that. That's great. Uh, master's in social work from UNC Chapel Hill. And Megan now working as a social worker at the Make-A-Wish Foundation, where she oh. was a wish, a wish kid many years ago, and her brother Patrick working in a flower shop. So again, I think for all of us, you know, we want our kids and for any of the and any of the work we do in our, our great industry um, to try to just give people, families more, more time, more quality of life, of course, but it also enables researchers across this great virtuous circle to think about what's next. It gives us more time as innovators to go back to the drawing board and to think, how can we do better? And that's something we, we continually think about. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. You okay. mentioned um, that there are more than 8,000 rare diseases and that you're technology agnostic, but how um, do you feel that you really have to start from scratch with each of the rare diseases that you look into, or is there anything that you learned from pay or from an, of the other diseases that you're studying that can build on and help with other areas? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the learnings, Sarah, is that rare diseases are not monolithic. You know, they are not all the same. You're going to, we're going to get to the point where we realize for each disease and for each individual within that disease, we need custom tailored approaches. Um, so, you know, for us, uh, you know, given that there's this interpatient variability, the heterogeneity of diseases, even though there may be common biology, common pathophysiology, to really think truly as each disease as an N of one within those uh -huh. diseases. And so for us, you know, we'll start with understanding a, a disease, we'll understand the, the pathways, the biology, the receptors, whatever it may be that's involved. And then we'll think about you know, where are the best technologies? And thankfully now in, in the rare diseases, you're starting to get to the point, take a disease like cystic fibrosis, where a, you know, a biotech company, Vertex, you know, with a, a, an enormous number of global researchers and investigators has developed now a series of medicines um, that profoundly change the course of cystic fibrosis, where that was a death sentence. You look at pediatric oncology, you look at the advances, we still have so much more work to do. But I can take it back to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. You know, we just on Saturday celebrated the 43rd anniversary of the very first wish 
And there was no Wish Foundation. It was a couple of families coming together to help a little boy named Chris Gracious, who was in the very last stages of battling a childhood leukemia. And Chris's wish was to be a police officer and, and they made him a cop for a day and it was wonderful. And four days later, he, he passed away. And the night before he told his mom that that day was the best day of his life. You know, these are the moments we need to create. But you look at childhood leukemia that was almost universally a death sentence when Chris had his wish in 1980. And now thankfully more children, many more children survive their childhood leukemias. We still need to do a lot more and, and do it faster. But you know, these are the things that, that, that get us excited about how we can fundamentally change the course of a disease. And so we look at the disease, we look at different technologies, and then we look at our capabilities or capabilities of others in the field um, to move forward. That's great. Now, what does um, patient engagement in the research pipeline look to you look like to you? Um, it's one of the things that we focus on, and and how it can look different across each disease, but across the R and D pipeline as well. It's incredibly important for a whole num a number of reasons. When we started our first biotechnology company, Novazyme, I you know we had a very patient focused organization because of our family's history in, in putting that together. It was very real and, and a tremendous sense of urgency. And we instilled that in the team from day one. But also too, we put together a, 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 the first ever team of patient advocates. I, I'm pretty sure we coined the phrase patient advocacy at Novazyme. And then when we became part of Genzyme, we brought that to Genzyme. And you look at a company like Genzyme, now part of Sanofi, you know, very, very patient focused. And that's something we brought to Amicus when we founded it. Uh, even in, in, in choosing that, you know, it's always so hard to pick a, a name for a new biotechnology company. Um, we chose something a little bit different. We chose the Latin word for friend, Amicus, because we wanted to be constantly reminded that we should be the most patient-focused, patient-friendly con company in, in all of our industry. And that was a lot more than choosing the name. It meant you know, some tangible steps we had mm -hmm. to take. So while at our first company, we had a department of patient advocacy, a director of patient advocacy. At Amicus, I wanted it to be core to who we are. So we named a chief patient advocate, a C-suite level executive. At Amicus, it's, it's been Jane Gershkowitz from day one. And you know Jane and her team is the conscience of the company. Mm -hmm. Jane has always reported to the chief executive officer of Amicus. Been mm -hmm. a member of the executive team, sit on the board meetings, and you know what I do ask everybody at Amicus, everybody who is a passionate entrepreneur in the company, that's mm -hmm. essential for for being a part of the organization, is to think with every business decision. If you had the disease you're working on, <clears throat> excuse me or you were the mother or father of a child with that disease, mm -hmm. how would you make that decision? Who would you hire? Where would you build a facility? When would you start a program? The toughest thing we do in our industry is knowing when to stop. When have we persisted far enough that we need to move in another direction? Bringing that patient mindset, it means you know we have a medical advisory board, a scientific advisory board, but for each of our diseases, we have patient advisory boards. And those, we pioneered those a number of years ago, and those are now increasingly common. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's important. It, it builds a great sense of purpose and mm -hmm. mission into the organization. And, and that's incredibly important in, in de, you know, designing our culture and, and making sure that that culture permeates everything we do. Mm -hmm. But it also is smart business. It gives us, I think, a real advantage to make sure that we're choosing the right endpoints that we're thinking about what's really meaningful to people living with a disease. You know, we may scientifically or medically have a point of view, but understanding the journey, the day-to-day -day life experience of somebody living with a health challenge in our world, it's rare diseases, mm -hmm. incredibly important. And that means a higher likelihood of success through clinical studies, a higher likelihood of getting to more patients more quickly when our medicines are approved. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not only the right thing to do, I think it's a necessary thing to do. That's great. I like the idea of the chief patient advocate. I think that's really neat. I you know I was in Boston last summer and and I was really pleased. It was a, a conference of patient advocates, hundreds of representatives from many many companies, uh, and just to see that, knowing that twenty plus years ago, 
that title didn't even exist in any of our companies. We need to do more of it, but to see that, to see the vibrancy of, of those teams coming together, sharing, collaborating ideas, best practices. And one of the things I shared is that I, I would strongly recommend for all of our peer CEOs in the industry to, um, to have somebody reporting directly to them, not mm -hmm. make it part of your commercial, medical, clinical organization um, to make mm -hmm. it report directly to the CEO. Yeah. What about the um, patient advisory boards? If people, um, any of our members listening today aren't, how do they get involved if they're interested? So we do that. Um, our patient advocates will think about uh, folks in the community, and some of them may be leaders of formal patient organizations. Uh, some of them may be, you know, very um, uh, outspoken advocates in the community. Others may be just moms and dads or actual patients themselves who we've come to know. And then we'll ask them, you know, do they have the time to participate? Um, we'll we'll put them under confidential disclosure. We'll share with them the most proprietary information we have. We'll show them our preclinical studies, regulatory correspondence. Mm -hmm. Give you a very, very concrete example. Um, our Pompeii drug that's now on the cusp of approval. Uh, it, when we started planning for that clinical study, first study eight years ago, <clears throat> our team had internally developed a phase one, two clinical trial protocol. We did take it to a medical advisory board of experts, but before mm -hmm. we did that, we got together with a dozen patients uh, mm -hmm. and family members and asked them what they thought. Mm -hmm. And there's some parts of it they loved and some parts of it, for instance, we had deep muscle biopsies mm -hmm. in that study to look at you know, how our medicine may be affecting the substrate that builds up in people living with Pompe disease. And they said, absolutely not. We've done too many of those, they're too variable, um, they're painful. And, uh, and we shared that feedback with regulators. I think that's maybe just one, one further comment on this. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just within our company and it's not just patients and patient organizations to the company, it's importantly including regulators in the process. In mm -hmm. Europe, they do a magnificent job of bringing in patient experts, actually having sit on the medical, uh, their FDA equivalent, the EMA, mm -hmm. patients, patient advocates to bring that perspective. And increasingly, I'm very pleased with what I'm seeing at the FDA, mm -hmm. um, where the FDA is very open to hearing from patients. It used to be You'd bring folks to your, um, you know, your advisory board just prior to your approval, and that's where patients would speak. And and that's not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. We have a policy at, at Amicus that every interaction we have with a regulatory body, we have to have a patient adv advocate, patient representative outside of the company to come in. We be we begin every clinical meeting with the FDA with a patient speaking for five minutes, that's and you great. only get you only get sixty minutes. Mm -hmm. but for them to share that perspective. And I see increasingly the FDA being very, very open to that informally, but also very formally through things like the uh, uh, patient-focused uh, forums that they do now, yeah. part of which came out of some of the legislation like 21st century cures. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Switching gears a little bit, um, what are some of the greatest barriers you're seeing to innovation today, maybe personally or across the board? Yeah, I, there there are a number of barriers still. Um, first, of course, science and medicine. These diseases are just hard. You look in, in the rare disease space, many, many of these disorders are neurologic. I uh, just last night, a, a, a good friend uh, lost his son uh, after a, a 14, 15 year battle with San Filippo disease, devastating neurologic brain disease. You know, we've worked at Amicus for years in Batten disease. You know, there's various subtypes of Batten, but um, some of them are among the most prevalent and devastating brain diseases mm -hmm. in children. Um, they're, they're hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to be committed as a, as a community. Academic researchers, the NIH, industry, regulators, mm -hmm. um, to being continually open to newer and better ways of developing medicines in the most difficult diseases like those rare brain diseases. But if we do that, we'll also, I believe, unlock some of the secrets for how we treat uh, some of the more prevalent brain diseases. Um, frontal temporal dementia, how we think about Alzheimer's broadly, mm -hmm. Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, by studying rare diseases, we'll unlock more of those pathways. We'll understand better, for instance, Sarah, how we, how we use biomarkers. Mm -hmm. Simply doing a clinical study and 
a fatal brain disease in children and saying, well, compare it to placebo or even natural history and do a five-year study. You, you can't do that. That's just not acceptable. It's not fair. It's not ethical. So scientific barriers continue, but we've got to persist and we've got to take on these hardest challenges. Um, there are financial barriers still, you know, when, and when the markets are highly volatile, biotech tends to be among, if not the most volatile sector. And, you know, capital and cash are the lifeblood of companies in our industry. So we need to make sure that, you know, we have a capital market system globally, but particularly anchored here in the United States, that's fostering the development of venture-backed companies, angel-backed companies, and companies like ours for many years that's needed access to capital to drive our medicines forward. So there are financial barriers that are really acute. You know, mm -hmm. if you look over the last uh, two years, we're starting to see many, many biotech companies fail because they don't have access to capital anymore. And we need policymakers who are mindful of that. Um, and regulatory, I, you know, a lot of times our, our medicines, our science advance faster than our regulatory science can keep up with. We need to continue to have an open dialogue with regulators. I, you know, there's a, a movement afoot to separate completely as best they can the discussions of regulators and innovators in medicine, science, biotechnology. And that I think is a huge mistake. It's exactly what we did not do in COVID. In COVID, Peter Marks and his team at FDA, everybody involved in the development of many vaccines and therapeutics were 24 seven collaborating with innovators, with industry, with researchers. That's the mindset we need. We need to completely respect the independence and the primacy of regulators, but we need that constant dialogue and that collaboration. Um, so that that's, you know, there are regulatory barriers, there's inconsistency, there's sometimes uh, uh, in, we see an inability to adapt to new technologies. You know, we're looking in some of the rare diseases at, you know, getting beyond the six minute walk test, for instance, and thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, composites of endpoints, quality of life measures, getting away from placebo and, you know, using historical controls on progression of disease um, and a mindset, you know, having a mindset that we need to take risks, particularly where the outcomes are so devastating and severe for people living with a whole range of health disorders. So scientific, regulatory, financial, uh, and ultimately, these medicines have to be paid for. So uh, an ecosystem where medicines are fairly priced and universally accessible. You know, we will not have succeeded. Uh, you know, Janet Woodcock at FDA had a great speech a number of years ago, and she said, until the person living under a bridge, a homeless person, has access to the state-of-the-art CAR-T therapies, we will not have succeeded. And Janet was right. So we need to continue to evolve those ecosystems uh, and, and make sure we can support all of this great science. And that, that's part of the good news is there has never been a more exciting time to be in our industry and never a more exciting time where research is so important. And, and you know, you, you take, you know, Pompeii disease, take any number of rare diseases where 25 years ago, I had to travel the world to find two, maybe three doctors who knew anything about the disease. And now we've got, you know, a dozen plus companies working just in Pompeii disease. We finally have approved medicines in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, you look at the range of technologies that we have, uh, small molecules, large molecules, gene therapies, gene editing coming. That's, that's going to transform human health. Um, and we need to make sure that all those barriers that I just talked about, that we're constantly finding ways to knock them down. Because otherwise it'll be you know, delay and denial. And uh, unfortunately, as we know, delay and denial only equal suffering and death. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not acceptable, but we've got such great science. Well, you set me up. It looks like you have a glimmer of hope. What does the R&D um, ecosystem pipeline look like in the next 10 years for you? What's, what's your vision of the future? Well, I think, you know, if you look at some specific examples, you look at some of the new cancer diagnostics you look at companies that are you know, developing blood-based cyst surveillance systems, take a disease like a pancreatic cancer, a colon cancer, if diagnosed in the very earliest stages, are generally very highly treatable. But when diagnosed in later stages are, you know, have, have very 
you know, very, very dire outcomes. So if we can get to a paradigm, and I believe we can in the next decade or so, where is part of your annual health checkup, you're having a blood test and you're screening for biomarkers of potential cancers, and then going into more detailed tests, and we're getting to them earlier, we'll alleviate an, an enormous amount of human suffering. It will also save the healthcare system an enormous amount of cost along the way. So that, that's just one example of where we can get to newborn screening, making mm -hmm. sure that newborns are tested for a whole battery of human genetic disorders so that as we continue to develop these new therapies, they get to these children as quickly as possible. Uh, and then obviously, you know, with the decreasing costs of an entire human genome sequence, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, very shortly here, the first page of everybody's healthcare record is going to be your DNA sequence and an interpretation of what are your risk factors and a plan for how you treat them either with medicines, diet, or you know any number of therapies and lifestyle changes. So, I, you know, can we continue to extend the human lifespan? I don't know, but can we continue to improve the quality of health? I, I'm absolutely convinced that we can in a very very dramatic way. Um, so the, the future is very bright. And again, I, I made some allusion to, to gene editing, um, mm -hmm. just starting to see in vivo proof of concept where we are not just treating or managing, you know, devastating diseases, we're curing them. We mm -hmm. need to, the same mindset we had with COVID and Operation Warp Speed, we need to collaborate together. We need to realize that it's not just the, the uh, mistakes or problems of nature that lead to these human health challenges um, that we need to uh, take on as much as it is the notion of time and the urgency where time is so important. We would, we know we would have come up, we were pretty hopeful we would have come up with vaccines in COVID. We never thought in the spring of 2020, we would do it as fast as we did. Um, and that's, that's just so fundamental to who we are in this research ecosystem, to who we are in biotechnology and when we look out, it's not, it's, you know, most importantly, being able to extend and enhance human life, but it's also a tremendously vibrant industry for, uh, for, for America. You know, the, the, the amount of job creation in all 50 states owing to biotechnology. And candidly, there's also a very important national security element to continue to be the medicine chest of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Again, reference what we did with COVID vaccines. So. Uh, I, I do think the future is bright. I, I guess maybe one way to, to summarize it is I just hope we don't screw it up. <laughs> um, well, I don't want to monopolize. I just want to jump in here. If there's anyone else that has any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Um, but while you're thinking those through, I'm going to keep going. Um, I'm glad to hear that you think that the future is bright. Um, and the excitement that you have is is really nice nice to see. I think that there is... Um, as Research America's mission is uh, sort of cross-cutting that bench to bedside and our members and that um, that partnership, I think really is sort of what drives us all, drives us all forward. Um, what advice, you know, we talked about um, patient engagement, but on a very different um, space, what advice would you give to parents or advocates that are interested in establishing their own foundation or company. Um, you had, you said 20, 20 years in, in this space. Do you recommend it? Yeah, 25 years, I'm even older than that. But um, <laughs> first thing, yes, absolutely. You need to be your, your child's, your family's number one advocate in every, every healthcare engagement that you have, educational engagement. I think, you know, I, I talked to many, many families, moms, dads over the years, and many of them begin by asking, you know, how do we start a company? Some of them begin by asking, how do we start a foundation? And then we're happy to provide those ideas and lessons learned and, and resources. But the first thing I, I ask them is to step back and to think, you know, where is the unmet need in your disorder? So many of these diseases have no formal foundations whatsoever, and they need them. So yes, in those cases, it makes sense. Build awareness of your disease partner with similar disease foundations as yours whenever you can. Um, you know, oftentimes I'll try to counsel families that the most important thing they can do is number one, find more people with the disease, because when you do, you'll alleviate uncertainty for them. 
hopefully guide them to treatments that are in development, but you'll also make it even more feasible for biotech companies and others to be more interested. Some of these diseases where you're literally talking about handfuls of children, it's really hard to come up with any you know, investment or business model whatsoever to, to support research. We have to solve those. We can't abandon those. So I think there's strong public-private partnerships to address those. But really just continue to find more patients, build natural history studies, um, high quality registries, are incredibly important as we do clinical research to accelerate research to give us a higher degree of certainty of the likelihood of success of our clinical research um, and to save time. So, you know, think about do you need a foundation? Do you partner with a foundation? Even if there's one in existence or one you build, what's your area of focus? Sometimes, yes, it's all in about raising money for research, but sometimes it's also about just advocacy, education, finding patients, building those registries, natural history studies. And sometimes you, you, you do need to become an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, going back a little bit, we touched on this, but there's um, we had a speaker on last week, I think about the, the impact of the IRA. What, from your perspective, does this have any impact on the, the medical research um, R&D pipeline from where you it see it? Yeah, it does. The, the Inflation Reduction Act is not helpful for research and innovation. There, there are elements of it. I, you know, I've, I've always been a, a proponent, and many of us in the industry, of um, ensuring universal access and looking at something like copays. I, I believe we should revisit the entire notion of copays in, in wide therapeutic areas. Take, you know, cancer, rare diseases. People living with those dis disorders, they have enough skin in the game. They don't need to pay a copay too, and and the IRA, you know, had some positive steps on you know reducing the the out of pocket drug spending, for instance, uh, down to two thousand dollars a year. Uh, so there were elements of it that I think were helpful. What was not helpful, however, was imposing mandated price caps. The whole notion that you're going to have a negotiation um, with you know innovators and developers, it, it's it's not what it is. And, you know, when the government comes in and tells you what the price is going to be, and if you don't accept it, you have, I think, it, I, I believe it's something like 95% tax on your revenue, which mm -hmm. it's government mandated price controls. We see this around the world in other systems, healthcare systems where, um, you know, they, they resort to rationing, government mandated um, uh, dictates on what medicines patients can have and when they can have them. Socialized medicine is is great unless you're sick. Um, so for us, I think we need to make sure how do we drive innovation? How do we drive productivity? How do we make sure that we have universal access? And sometimes there's a lot of tension there as well. Um, but I do think the the IRA um, broadly is is not going to be helpful. And then there, candidly, Sarah, there are parts of it that are just plain awful and that have no basis in science or in policy. And you know the example I'll give you is when you when they talk about you know periods of exclusivity, they made a distinction between small molecules and large molecules. So large molecules, of course, generally protein-based therapeutics. Small molecules, chemically you know created medicines. Over ninety percent of all new medicines are small molecules, but they gave a thirteen-year exclusivity to large molecules, but only a nine-year period of exclusivity. And so what's going to happen is even though that's you know the, the that's the pipeline of of what we're developing largely, while they're exciting a lot of exciting large molecules, uh, and there's a lot of innovation and research and risk that goes into those developments. With the small molecules, though, though again, that's the vast majority of new medicines going forward, and you just provided an enormous disincentive to companies to invest in small molecules. Um, you know, if you talked about families, I know many families who have for years been raising money for research and a lot of their hopes are pinned on these small molecules. And now they're struggling getting financing because capital markets are rational and they're gonna to go to where there's a longer period of exclusivity. And you, know, you could argue 13 years isn't even enough. I think they should just change that, make them both 13 years. Um, that is, a, a whether it's a quirk of the law or people just weren't thoughtful, I, I, I don't know. And there's an effort afoot to, to raise the awareness that that, that makes no sense. Um, you know, there, there is a carve out for many rare and orphan medicines, and I think that's good. 
uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act and these price, these government mandated price caps. But another quirk of the law, which is bad policy, is that you only get that if you have one rare or orphan indication. Well, think about it. And there have been companies who have explicitly stated that they are not going to develop a medicine for more than one indication. Well, in some of these rare diseases, medications may be applicable to more than one rare disease, but it means you need mm -hmm. a lot of risk, capital investment, time to prove it in clinical studies. And when you make all of that investment, take all of that risk, if you get that second indication for another rare disease to help people, you may lose your protection and be thrown back in like you know, some of the more common drugs that are gonna be subjected to these government price caps. So what's happening is people are now being you know, pretty myopic and necessarily, and focusing only on one rare disease. And that's a shame. And, you know, in an area like pediatric oncology, that would be devastating. Um, so we, we, there are changes we need to put in place to the IRA uh, now that it's law and, and we'll have to manage through it. But broadly, as a principle, price controls aren't the way that we need to do. Companies need to be responsible. You know, I was, I was honored a couple of years ago to be the co-author, and we garnered hundreds of co-signatories for a new patient commitment. And what we said was as biotech CEOs, we have a moral obligation to ensure our medicines get to everybody who needs them. Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, we provide the tools that doctors, nurses use to heal. And that's a special obligation. And it means we need to be thoughtful about where and how we price our medicines, how we ensure access. I, with Amicus, when we launched our first drug, we said we would never raise the price annually max more than the consumer price index. And that's when the CPI for years was at 2%. And we've stuck to that pledge. So, uh, you know, that enables third-party payer systems to plan their budgets accordingly. And I think, you know, just one example of how we've tried to be responsible as well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot more that we need to do in terms of managing our own behaviors and managing the way in which we um, develop our medicines and get them to as many people as quickly as possible. But the reality is the the biopharmaceutical industry is one of the great industries we have in this country. And what we've been able to do to change people's lives, we need to do a lot more of that. And, and with the tools, the science that some of which we just talked about, it, it's increasingly there. And we, again, just need to make sure we've got policies and frameworks set up to accelerate that research and get it to everybody. Because uh, I go back to 25 years ago, and when Eileen and I were told that there was nothing that can be done, I'm sorry, you know, go, go ahead and enjoy the time you have. Um, that's just not acceptable anymore. So well put. I agree. So Sarah, I'm Eileen, a pop-up guest. Yes, please. I was going to say, I see you. So I wanted to acknowledge you, please. You know that I adore John. So there was no way I was going to hey. stay off camera the whole time. <laughs> John, I have a question, and it's a perfect question for you. Your last comments are just completely emblematic. Um, and it's a question I've been asking a lot of our various guests. Do you perceive realistically the possibility of a cross-sector, really all comers, but um, people of goodwill, leaders like you, leaders from across the healthcare system and outside of it, getting together and trying to determine a systemic approach to get at access and affordability. Could there be, is there a path that could take place because there are gonna be winners and losers, right? There's not, you know, it's there's really, there's a squeezing on the balloon thing that a systems approach could help address by finding, you know, if you reduce drug costs, you increase hospitalization costs, you know, but um, but do you see that as kind of a pipe dream or do you see that as a possibility? I, I think, Ellie, um, it's not only a possibility. I think it's a necessity. I think we need that. It's just an open die. There's so much on either end of the political spectrum here. Um, just, you know, people saying things that either they don't mean or they really don't understand. And so let's have a candid conversation. The answer can't be, by the way, from industry, well, you know, we take all of our profits, we put it into R&D, and then that's, you know, it's important. To, that's, you know, we need to have a candid conversation yeah. um, about, you know, how do we ensure a vibrant, innovative system that gets medicines, the best medicines to as many people as quickly as possible, and also stop thinking about it 
as a fixed pie. Think about, think about efficiencies, productivities. I mean, you guys have been wonderful advocates over many years now, you know, the notion of moving from a disease care system to a healthcare system. Right. How do we align us incentives around that? You know, right. smoking, how do we get more people to stop smoking? Can't right. be commercials telling them they're going to get sick. It's probably not going to do it. But how do you provide incentives for people to stop smoking and support? Mental health is such a challenge across the, the country, the world today. How do we not make this, you know, a public public health crisis? Um, and we all need to come together. I, I think, you know, whether that's something I, I'd love to see the White House come together and, and put that together. I'd love to see a council on biotechnology and innovation. Um, yeah. And really think, you know, where and how do we invest? What works best in our system? Where are there gaps? And how do we close those gaps? That's terrific. Well, consider yourself a volunteer. Oh, we're, we're I, really, I, um, you know, I'll, we'll be talking I, more about this, but I knew, I knew you were already on my hit list. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that you ever want to be on Ellie's hit list, but um, <laughs> in a good way, in the best yeah, way. like fancy, you got the, the, the nice list and the naughty list. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, no, I'm, I'm happy interrupt. to help. We need to just have this open dialogue. It just gets lost in this echo chamber. Excuse me. This echo chamber in Washington, and you know, bring in yes, bring in industry, bring in research, but bring in these families. Yes, and, and don't don't just have them tell you know their 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 life stories, which can be inspiring, but also tragic in many cases. It's good for people to hear that, but let's talk practically. What do we need to solve these right. challenges going forward? Right. What do, what do we think you know healthcare in America looks like in 10, 20, 30 years? You know, I hear people in Washington, and there was another one a week or two ago, uh, who said, well, we just need to, you know, set our prices in America the same as we do in Europe. Well, okay. You know, I sat down with a U.S. senator once, and I told him, I said, Senator, I, I can guarantee you, I can bring drug costs down almost 100% in the next decade. And he leaned forward and asked, how do we do that? I said, stop making new medicines. We've made a lot. We've, we've you know, dramatically expanded you know, our, our uh, success rates in cardiovascular and cancer and others, but we just say, look, this is as good as it's going to get, and we're going to invest elsewhere. And he kind of shakes, well, no, we can't do that. He said, well, okay, so now let's talk about what can we do. Right. Realistic answers, and they're, and they're hard to find, but that that's right. the truth. That's yeah, I mean, anytime we try to re-engineer a whole healthcare system, it's, um, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> and we don't need to do that even. You know, we just need to you know, even incremental approaches going forward yeah. would be would mm -hmm. be meaningful. Um, and then just stopping the worst ideas, too. Right, right. It set right. us back. I, you know, you not to harp on the Inflation Reduction Act, but you look at some of the analyses coming out. There was one out of I think it was the note here. The University of Chicago said in the next twenty, uh, I'm sorry, next fifteen years, we'll have 135 fewer medicines than we otherwise would have had without the IRA. And, and the challenge is you can't point today to somebody who's suffering because of the IRA, but five, 10, 15 years from now, I, I hope we can't, but without any changes, we may point and say kind of what could have been, and that would be it. Well, I, I, I really like the idea of people stepping up with alternative solutions that let look at the system because it's the system that's at risk. And uh, prescription drug spending is a piece of a puzzle. That's it's an important piece, but it's a piece of a puzzle. It's not it's not in a vacuum. And uh, so this has been terrific. And I'm so sorry, Sarah. I'm turning no, back to I'm you. Turn my camera off. No, it's great. You, it was great because my last question was how we help more people, and I think we got there. And to your point, I think it's incrementally. I think it's together. Um, and so. Having you today, John, has been terrific, and I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts, your ideas, um, and next steps forward. So thank you again for being here. And as Ellie said, I think I've got some ideas for next steps for working together. So I look forward to yeah, it. Yeah, happy to. We'll, we'll, we can bring a whole community together Perfect. and think about uh, you know, what's been done before. Think about what the HIV AIDS community did years ago. You know, they were not silent in their suffering and what it's led to today, where we are with treatments and you know, ultimately cures for that devastating disease. Um, we need an Operation Warp Speed and rare diseases. We need a moonshot 
in yes, cancer, but in, in many of these challenges, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Um, so good news is we really are on this cusp of a, a golden age in medicine. And again, I hope we can just accelerate it as fast as we can. So thank you guys do great work. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. For everybody else, thank you so much for joining the discussion today. Um, before we go, I have one um, more item. Again, if you're interested in becoming a Research America a member and you aren't today, please reach out to my contact, Joel, and uh, join us next Tuesday, May 9th, uh, for a Research America member uh, meeting with uh, Sarah Maskornik with the Senate Help Committee. Sarah will provide an update on reauthorization of the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, or PAPA. So see you then and thanks everybody. Bye-bye.